One thing that is surprising as you start to learn more about C is the prevalence of undefined behavior in the language. Here's an example. I have a function which will determine whether or not something is the minimum possible value. If you remember the implementation of integers, they're implemented by two's complement, and therefore, when you hit the smallest integer, you'll actually, if you subtract one from that, you'll wrap around and you'll end up with something larger. So this program is intended to find the minimum integer, starting at about negative two billion, because we know it's somewhere down there. And while we have not found the min value, we just subtract one from i until we're done. So the output we would expect from this program is something like this. We compile it, we get the minimum value. And indeed, this is something I got a few years ago when I ran this in GCC. What I get today um, is an infinite loop. It used to be I had to turn on the optimizer really high or higher in order to get this, but now I can't uh, turn the optimizer low enough to have it not do this. What's going on? Well, what's going on here is that in C, the language specifies that if you ever subtract from a number and you end up with an underflow, so wrapping around, that entire program is undefined. It can do whatever it wants. It can launch the missiles. It can do anything. Now, why would a language designer say that? And in the particular case of underflow and overflow, you have to think back to the days when C was created. Um, at that time, there was a debate between one's complement and two's complement. And different computers implemented the numbers in different ways. And therefore, underflow and overflow could actually give you different results. That's not true anymore. Uh, two's complement one. And so, in fact, Java defines numbers to wrap around in that way. But at the time C was created, it wasn't clear. So the authors didn't want to hamper the implementation. And so they just said, well, if you do this, it's not a C program anymore. It's all undefined. There's other examples of similar cases. Um, if there are two operations on the same memory location that are inside of an expression. So two updates to the same memory location in an expression, the program is actually considered undefined. You'll get a warning if you run a program like this on Clang. The reason for this is again to, in this case, to give the compiler writers freedom in terms of how they implement these things. They did not want to force left to right evaluation. They thought it might be possible to do right to left. It might be possible to do other things. So anytime you update a memory location um, in two parts of an expression, then the program is considered undefined. Um, this may strike us as uh, very odd. And indeed, um, it is a bit odd. <laughs> um, but it's a feature of C, and there are indeed many, many, many undefined behaviors in C. And this can lead to all sorts of uh, surprising things. So uh, here's an example. Here's the type of a function. I have a variable of that type, and I have a uh, actual function. Now I have a function that's never called. <laughs> that will assign uh, to this global variable. And then in my main program is going to actually invoke that function. So what you would expect if you actually executed this program is a null pointer exception because the variable here is never initialized. This function's never called. We've never actually assigned any value to the function do. And so what we'd expect is some sort of horrible um, exception when we attempt to call this function on a variable that's not been initialized. Um, however, if you ever dereference a pointer in C, 
that is not initialized, then the program is undefined. So in this case, this is a real compiler. The compiler looks and sees that this is the only assignment ever to this variable, and therefore we can just use it. So the compiler decides to simply use this and it optimizes all this stuff away. So your main program essentially just calls this uh, function. So you can end up with surprising effects of these compiler optimizations. And there's a few more linked here. Um, you can see some discussion there. There's very interesting examples of this on Wikipedia and other places. So you can see some examples of undefined behaviors. Um, array overflow and underflow accessing uh, through an, a pointer which has been deallocated. So in the worksheet for this week, you'll have some work on dangling pointers, uh, which are interesting um, in terms of how those work, because C is also very liberal about pointers. So I, I think you could argue that any large C program is, has an un, is, is undefined, uh, just, just simply because it's very hard to follow all of these rules to avoid undefined behavior in C. It's almost impossible. So the contrast to this is safe languages. And the goal in a safe language is to avoid any kind of undefined behavior. So um, Java is sort of the canonical example, modern example. It's uh, write once, run anywhere. It has a predictable behavior. And the language is defined to be predictable. Java is the first widely used safe language. Um, but what we're going to learn about this week is actually the earliest safe language ever used, which was Lisp. And we'll talk about it through its variant scheme.